Um, <clears throat> good morning again uh, from it's a very cold and dark uh, Washington morning. Um, my thank yous to the conference organizers, the audience, you and fellow panelists. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's understanding uh, as I present uh, over uh, Zoom. So, and please interrupt if you can't hear me clearly. Um, thank you. In the immediate post-war period, little discussion of restitution of cultural property to Holocaust survivors and their heirs took place. Political changes in Europe signaled the failure of the allied officials' ability to negotiate restitution policy, which created problems for claimants. European governments delayed, some preventing restitution by imposing deadlines on the claimants. Some Jewish survivors did not file their claims because they may have lacked the desire to relive that part of the war. Many were unaware of the filing deadlines. Mm -hmm. My talk today focuses on restitution of identifiable property to Austrian Jews. I argue that it was this time period in which the Jews experienced a secondary form of expropriation as their cultural property was lost to the Austrian state believed to be in a position of protection and not confiscation. Uh, there we go. Compared to other Jewish aid organizations, the United Restitution Organization, or URO, remains understudied and calls for a re-evaluation of post-war reconstruction of survivors. Established in 1948, by Jewish organizations and administered under the umbrella of the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, or the Claims Conference, the URO became the le largest legal entity assisting Jews who had meager financial means and not covered under other post-war compensation agreements. Although the URO charged a modest administrative fee when claims were approved successful, most claimants' legal costs were borne by the URO. The lawyers and staff were themselves European Jewish refugees. When the URO closed in 1968, its lawyers helped approximately 350,000 victims of Nazi persecution by filing nearly 500,000 claims. Estimated total value of awards between 1949 and 1959 was about 550 million to 1 billion US dollars. <clears throat> After the division of Germany and Austria into occupied zones in 1945, the allied military governments enacted legislation to provide restitution to the victims of Nazism. Yet restitution varied, laws became complicated with the goal of quick justice under unparalleled post-war circumstances. In Germany, the Bundestag passed the federal indemnification law in the early 1950s. And at first, this legislation did not cover restitution claims for movable property confiscated or destroyed by the Nazis, as the government had not accepted its liability to pay the compensation for the property robbed by the Nazis. Upon Jews' return in 1945 to Austria, they experienced rampant anti-Semitism as Austrian government officials did not want them to stay. The officials' political and private statements created a culture of unwillingness to negotiate for realistic compensation to survivors and their heirs. Origins of double expropriation of the Austrian Jews can be found in the Allies' Moscow, Conf Moscow Declaration of 1943, which states that Austria was the first victim of Nazi aggression. Thus, Austria, both a defeated enemy and victim, did not have any legal obligation to make reparations or restitution for Nazi crimes, and the country's so sovereignty should be restored at war's end. This became Austria's victim theory, a fundamental myth of Austria's post-war society. The interim government responded slowly to its responsibilities regarding its crimes and emphasize Austria's victim status to avoid paying reparations. For many Jews, the Moscow Declaration prevented legal justice as their claims were fought by non-Jewish owners who acquired some of the Jewish property during the war. With Allied approval 
Austria enacted restitution legislation. However, the laws were laxed as officials delayed or ignored the, re the resolutions regarding the identification and return of Jewish owned property. From 1946 to 1949, the Austrian government passed seven restitution laws with the intention of returning the property. Yet the laws were beset with restrictions and new problems arose whenever changed. The third Restitution Act passed in February 1947, which was the legal basis <clears throat> for reclaiming looted property, either in the hands of private persons or public entities, thus significant for Jewish survivors, contained ambiguities and interpreted by officials to the claimant's disadvantage. By the early 1950s, an increasingly restrictive attitude towards Jews had become apparent as the political climate leaned more towards the reintegration of former Nazis. As a result, second expropriation of Austrian Jews by government officials emerged as these officials were encouraged to drag out the proceedings as endless supporting evidence had to be presented to officials by the claimants. Government officials required strict proof of ownership succession, requisite documentation that for many Jews were difficult to obtain. Claimants hoping for the return of their property were met with the reality that their personal possessions were not worthy of the restitution proceedings. The range and com complexity of the various legal acts and deadlines were, were irresponsible, and the state refusing to provide assistance to the claimants was uh, deplorable. Out of the Luxembourg agreements in 1952, um, and in response to Germany's refusal to pay claims for uh, from Austrian Jews who were victims of Nazi crimes, the Committee for Jewish Claims on Austria was established to negotiate restitution and assistance programs for Holocaust survivors. Yet complaints against Austria's handling of the cases persisted. And in reaction, the Victim Welfare Department of the Jewish Community of Vienna began working with the government in 1953 to facilitate the Jews' claims. The IKG also served as an intermediary between the URO and the Austrian government's War and Persecution Property D Damage Act of 1958, allowing for restitution of Nazi confiscated household and personal belongings. In 1959, URO client Rosa Kestenbaum filed her application only to learn that compensation for home furnishings was centered upon the basis of the size of the claimant's apartment, and payment was based on the number of points calculated by the government for each room. Thus, compensation was not awarded if one, if one owned furniture for a one-bedroom apartment or even a larger apartment. Limits included the maximum number of points for each room, According, according to the specific room that was furnished, i.e. Um, <clears throat> a, a one room, a, a bedroom was worth 1,600 points, the kitchen 800, bathroom 400. For household items not included in the list, flat point rates were given. So for linens, crockery, cutlery, and other small household items were assigned 300 points. Each point was, was then valued to an Austrian shilling of 180. Correspondence indicates that URO officials were unaware of the point system and wanted an explanation for the indiscriminate monetary values. The URO understood that payment was given for the number of confiscated household goods and not for the size of the apartment. In fact, if compensation was based just on the number of rooms, why describe all the furniture in detail? Perhaps Austrian officials needed need for more forms was another delay in rightful restitution for the Jews. Kestenbaum's case continued as the apartment configuration remained under investigation as the URO and government officials debating was that, was that the family apartment was one or two bedrooms. After nearly seven years, the case was settled in November of 1964, when Kestenbaum received approximately 7,000 shillings. Likewise, Alfred Taffel submitted numerous forms via the URO to receive restitution for the family's apartment. 
Required evidence included birth, marriage, and death certificates, dates of mother's deportation, and father's immigration to Switzerland, witness statements, and power of attorney. For household gifts, <clears throat> Tafel listed known property damage caused by the Nazis. Every form was required to appear in triplicate. Unfortunately, the witness statements were pointless, as none could confirm the household items Tafel listed were indeed the exclusive property of the family home. The second approach, <clears throat> excuse me, the second expropriation of Tafel's property occurred when Austrian officials required her to submit detailed physical description of, say, kitchen appliances, number of table and light fixtures, and what they were made of dimensions and fabric type for the curtains, number of serving plates, color and shapes of water and wine glasses. Like Kastenbaum, the point system was applied to Tafel's inventory of household goods. And in 1964, her settlement payment was approximately 19,000 Austrian shillings. <clears throat> Excuse me. My last example is here, George Rice, Compensation for the family's household goods and his musical instruments arrived in 1965, 11 years after filing his initial application. Weiss, a musician, was required to submit family birth and death certificates and photographs, documents of domiciles before and after the Anschluss, addresses of employment and yearly income, work licenses and musicians identification cards, <clears throat> confirmation of his parents' deportation to Theresienstadt, witness statements, and passports. Every document required a notary. As many cases show, if the documentation was not provided, the application could not be submitted in hopes of a positive settlement. Yet despite proof, government officials rejected Weiss's claim for the musical instruments on the grounds that he had not practiced a freelance position. His, he argued that his musician's card, hidden and saved from the Nazis, was proof that he was a professional musician and was registered according to then Austrian laws, thus entitled to compensation. Weiss explained the meaning of a freelance musician vis-a-vis -vis professional and self-employed musician, and the musical instruments he was claiming was his private property. Officials disagreed, stating that Weiss was an employed musician, thus not entitled to receive payment for the instruments. Moreover, officials wanted additional documents, including affidavits from those in the same profession, stating that Weiss had indeed practiced his possession. Evidence not originally asked for by the officials in the beginning of the claimant application. Weiss did not receive any payment as Austrian officials closed his case. Common to nearly all the cases were the difficult and costly tasks of producing evidence that was most likely falsified, destroyed, or non-existent. Bureaucratic delays and legal issues contributed to the claimant's frustrations. By stymieing their efforts to recover their own purse personal property, and despite the Austrian State Treaty of 1945, excuse me, 1955, outlining the sovereign state's obligations to compensate for war damage, government officials contributed to the second expropriation of Jewish-owned property. Officials feared that they would be held responsible for Nazi war crimes, and by paying Jewish survivors restitution claims, officials believed this showed the country's responsible actions towards the Jewish community. Austria governments denied its responsibility toward its Jewish community for many decades, claiming that the government did not create this problem. Rather, it was handed over to them by the Allies. For many Jews, the restitution system did not operate smoothly nor efficiently, revealing neglect, contradictions, and questionable legal maneuvers by government officials. As a Jewish aid organization, the URO case files are historically valuable and now available at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. These rich testimonies and correspondence provide documentary evidence to what happened to Austrian Jews during and after the war and shed light on the post-war interactions of survivors and government officials. Despite the URO's efforts before its closure in 1968, 
the amount of Nazi looted Jewish assets can never be enumerated. I thank you for listening and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments.